Hold on, let's do, come to the scripture together here. Being honest to God and honest in God's house is not something that church folks always do. And so let me begin this reading by telling you an interesting story. My father, who was religious in an oblique kind of way, he had the most forgiving heart. Uh, he had the sweetest spirit. Dad's been gone for a long time now. Um, but he had a perceptive honesty about a lot of religious stuff that would really pull you up short. And one thing he told me one, one time was, I don't like this passage of Scripture. I don't know where it came from, but Jesus didn't do it. You know, so as we take a look at it, uh, I just want you to have that background because as we read it, you might agree or you might not. But I want us to take a look at it. Where I'd like to do it today, if you don't mind, because it's a little long, is will you read every other paragraph out loud? I'll read one. Be careful in the middle there. Um, they're just a short one, but let's share the paragraphs. Hear then the word of God from Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them out into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So, so they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because, because no one is tired of us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the, the, the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first and the first last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah, let's pray real quickly. God, join us now as this word is preached, as it is offered in word and in hearing. Be present, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. He was 14 years old, a rebellious child, disobedient at home. He chose to run away more than once, but this time he was gone for almost five days. The family was frantic. The father got word out through some of his friends that he was looking for his son strongly, and the word was, I'm going to get you. And so the jig was up because someone accidentally let it get out where the young man was going to be going next. Sometimes they stay from house to house and friend to friend. And when he got to the house, his dad was there. And his dad said, I promised that I was going to get you, and I'm going to get you right now. And the boy stood there, and the father went to him and embraced him vigorously. Just when you least expect grace, it appears. Just when you thought that I'm going to get you means nothing but the wrath of God. There is an alternative that is offered. And that's why the gospel is called good news instead of bad. This passage of scripture is interesting for several reasons. One is this. It says that God is fair and just. Sometimes the experience of people... The human experience itself seems anything but fair and just. But there is an underlying reality in this passage of Scripture that is very curious. I make a promise, I keep a promise. I'll pay you a certain amount of money for a day's work. You can count on getting that pay at the end of that day. There is a justice and fairness about how God does things. Let that justice and fairness reach beyond this writing of Scripture into the life that you and I are called to live. 
Are we fair and just in our doings? If God is, then God expects that of us, that we try to act in our relationships and toward other people in ways that are dependable and fair and just. One of the things about my friend Art yesterday that I was able to say was that if he said he would do it, you could count on it. What has happened to that in our society these days? I'm not one of these people that wants to jump on the bandwagon of putting everybody and everything down. I want to lift up those men and women who give their word and keep it. And that's what this passage of Scripture is about. That God is ultimately fair and just, and that God is fair and just in all the time in between. Hold on to that, because that's one of the teachings that comes from this passage. Incidentally, a denarius, not a lot of money to us, but was a very good pay for that particular day and time. It was about the equivalent of a full day or even a several-day period up to a week period. Some people would work a whole week for that. Second thing is God is generous in this passage. These people that were not doing anything found uh, that there was something for them to do, that they could mean something. I cannot tell you the power of this experience of going back to Atlanta, leaving here at 9 o'clock in the morning and spending just enough hours to be there for the funeral and to be um, in the reception for a little time and getting on the plane and coming back, um, to be there with Art and Nancy and their son, uh, Gary. We always called him Gary. His name is Garrett. Um, and to walk into that reception area and to see the young people who were in our youth group 42 years ago, present in a wheelchair, one of them, the president of the youth group, together with a husband and all of these kids that we loved then, and to recognize that the love that once we shared a long time ago in another world away was intact and whole and that we could pick it up in an instant. The girl in the wheelchair said, and I quote, you probably wouldn't want to kiss me hello because I'm incontinent. I said, you probably wouldn't want to kiss me hello because I'm a sinner. And she laughed and we kissed. Love intact across the generations. This generous God that calls us to one another because he has called us to his own heart is the God of our salvation and the God who is the master of the vineyard and the God who is generous with love and generous with forgiveness and generous with his presence, the power of God, the presence of God, the divine person somehow or the other in our experience. It's a good word. Our kids... I don't know about you guys and your children, or you if you're still a child, have not always been careful with a buck. One of the good things about kids is you could always be sure that you could hear for them from them every now and then. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, when you needed something, uh, when they needed something, uh, they would certainly call. And, uh, but this particular passage is interesting because uh, one of our daughters is now the ultra-conservative with the money. This is the kid that, you know, could just blow it quicker than anybody you ever ran into. Um, but she's real conservative. And incidentally, I have a permission to use this illustration. I don't do that. Uh, I think that's important. Um, but she's extremely conservative with the money, and she's into Dave Ramsey. And, you know, Sherry Allen from our church does that course, if any of you are interested. And Dave says, if you don't have enough money to buy it, don't get it. <laughs> you know, and if you don't have cash, then don't spend it, you know. And uh, so she's kind of into that. And uh, this particular uh, passage is interesting here because Ramsey's always saying, how are you? People call him on the phone. How are you? He said, better than I deserve. And that's what this story is about. And that's why I didn't understand it the first time I read it. That's why my dad didn't understand it. That's why a lot of people don't like it because what it is, it's not a story about fair wages paid. It's a story about amazing grace. It's a story about the sufficiency of the grace of God in every circumstance and that you can find it if only you look for it. That the surprise of Labor Day, this Labor Day, is the surprise of nothing less than the grace of God coming to church. Sunday before last, I saw blue lights behind me and got pulled over. And uh, 
I put on my best clerical face <laughs> and uh, said, good afternoon, officer. And he said, you were going 50 in a 40 mile zone. May I see your license? And I flipped my wallet open. He said, would you please take it out? I can't see it in there. And uh, I gave it to him, and uh, he looked at it, and he said, Now, Reverend? (laughs) And uh, my stomach went, (sighs) and he said, Don't you think you should cut this out? I said, What? (laughs) And he said, You know. And I said, I do. Will you be careful? And drive more slowly after this? Yes, sir. And for three days, <laughs> I was better. Unexpected little piece of grace there, you know. I think of the 14 year old boy who's lost. I think of the father who's out to get him. And I remember that amazing story that if it's repeated a thousand, thousand times, is always fresh and new. The story in the Gospel of Luke where the young man had gone away and the father went out running to greet him. Not the morning angry father, not the father that was going to get him to hurt him, but the father that ran in his direction, didn't even just wait, waited long enough for the kid to come to to his senses. And this is a he and she reality. And then ran out to hold on tight. The bottom line of this particular story is that the value of discipleship is that you had a chance to do it. Those who came and worked late had the glorious opportunity of being in relationship to and in association with the Lord for the longest period of time. The reward of doing God's work is that you have done it, that you are doing it. The reward of God's work is not who gets what when. Why is it that we resent people who come on lately? There was a guy that was a notorious sinner and died down at Gulfport and left a check for $5,000 to buy some property to build a church. I ended up being the pastor of that church. And when people would talk about this fellow, they would say, but he was such a sinner. And at the last minute, he repented and he gave $5,000. And to make it worse, we named the church after him. Meditate on that for just a minute. If that's not grace, great God, what is? Huh? I never have told this story, but when I came to Wells, you know what was right there? A picture of Brother Wells. A great big picture. He had been a much beloved pastor here. He was a great saint. He had calluses on his knees when he was buried. The funeral director told me that. Calluses on his knees. Anyway, there was this huge picture of him. And I believe you earn the right to make changes in churches. You don't just come in and do all this change stuff. But I just couldn't preach with this big, huge <laughs> picture. of a, And was killed in a car wreck very tragically. His son was a neurosurgeon. He had gone to see him in Alabama, coming back. Uh, so the people loved and mourned him and were trying, to, were trying to do the right thing. And so I just took it and moved it. And several people told me thanks later on, you know, and put a little cross up. But you know what's interesting about Brother Wells? His name was Jim Wells. He was a great saint. He hated churches named after people. <laughs> you see, this grace thing is going to work whether you like it or not, whether you think you're in charge of it or not. Hey, God is the God of grace in charge of a lot of things. Anyway, if you'd like to see him, you can visit with him on the way out because we had him cut down from a four by six feet <laughs> to that nice little picture that's going up the stairs on the way out on your left. And what it is, he had a sermon he preached, ascending to heaven one step at a time. Well, I think that's a great thought, great sermon and you know so you can kind of do it that way um i i have run into some of you guys and gals that have come to me and looked me in the face and say i am this is this is this is not an actual person this is a composite i am 47 years old i have lived the sorriest life i have not cared about anybody but myself i have never really loved anything except me i have never done anything except that which is not helpful to myself i have pretty much been a representative of everything that's destructive and negative and all. But now I want God in my life, and I mean it. Is it possible? Sure. 
it's possible. And how dare we resent the person who gets paid at the end with the same kind of grace that we got paid a long time ago. That's what the story is really all about. The Labor Day surprise that comes from a God that's fair and just and generous even to a fault. But the kind of God who embraces us when we have been wrong and who kisses us whether we're continent or incontinent, whether our speech is glorious like angels or our speech is obstructed by the physiology of what we call a stroke. How wonderful to know that you and I have opportunity to labor in God's field then, now, whenever. Amen. Let's pray. It is a surprise, God, and you keep on doing confounding things like giving us more than we deserve. And that's what grace is all about. The week is ahead of us. The day is ahead of us. May we sense that more than we deserve and respond by being strengthened and becoming more useful because it's happened. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, don't... It's been a long time since I've had a chance to see you.